when a Marine had an RPG in his leg. The military is known for its strict adherence to rules, policies designed to keep its members alive in the worst of conditions, and to maintain discipline and order in chaotic circumstances. Sometimes, however, those on the battlefield disregard these rules in order to save the lives of their comrades. On January 12, 2012, a U.S. Army medical evacuation crew were ordered on what everyone thought was a routine flight. They were in Afghanistan, supporting the coalition effort in the region flying dust-off missions, airlifting the wounded to field hospitals for treatment. At the start of their flight, they had been briefed that a young Afghan girl had been wounded in the fighting and was in need of an airlift. Once the Black Hawk helicopter received clearance to land, however, they were greeted with quite a different scenario. Instead of an Afghan girl in need of aid, the wounded individual was 22-year-old U.S. Marine Lance Corporal Winder Perez. It wasn't a normal battlefield injury that made this situation unusual. Instead of a mundane bullet or shrapnel wound, something more substantial and far more concerning awaited them. The patient has unexploded ordnance, shouted the landing zone controller as the helicopter touched down. Once on the ground, the first member of the crew to make contact with the patient was Specialist Mark Edens. Greeting him was the wounded Perez, who had a two-foot-long, unexploded, rocket-propelled grenade jutting precariously from his leg, extending up to his abdomen. That call will be in my mind all my life, said Specialist Robert Hardesty, crew chief on the helicopter. First you land thinking it's a little girl, and the next thing it's a Marine with an unexploded RPG embedded in his body. The ubiquitous RPG-7 is a Soviet-designed, shoulder-fired rocket launcher, first manufactured in the early 1960s. In spite of its long service life, the weapons platform is inexpensive, costing between $500 to $2,000 per launcher. It's also lightweight, versatile, and readily available, making it the weapon of choice for insurgents and other underfunded fighting forces, and the most commonly used anti-armor weapon in the world. Many of these pieces found in Afghanistan are leftovers from the Soviet occupation of the country in the 1980s, though there is an active arms market through which these weapons can also be acquired. There are numerous warheads that can be launched from the RPG-7, including a myriad of anti-armor rockets, as well as anti-personnel fragmentation warheads. The AP rounds can penetrate upwards of 750 millimeters, or around two and a half feet of armor. During its long service life, the RPG-7 is responsible for shooting down more helicopters than most manned portable air defense weapons. When the medevac crew spotted Perez, they had to make a difficult choice. Military regulations strictly forbid the transport of patients with unexploded ordnance for obvious safety reasons. With the warhead jutting precariously from Perez's leg, even the slightest movement could set it off with disastrous results. Though the weapon had not detonated, a delayed reaction was still possible, sending a concussive blast and shrapnel from meters in all directions. When informed of the situation, medevac Captain Kevin Dew called for a vote from the rest of the crew. He was only willing to take Perez in his current condition if he received a unanimous vote in favor of airlifting the wounded Marine. He was unwilling to risk his crew or his helicopter unless there was universal approval from everyone on board. Without hesitation, all of the medical crew agreed, and soon Perez was quickly yet gingerly loaded onto the waiting Black Hawk. There was no doubt to anyone that we were going to take this Marine and get him the medical attention needed to save his life, said Du. What happened next was an agonizing 11-minute flight from the pickup location to a field hospital, located at Forward Operating Base Edinburgh, one in which even the slightest bump could spell disaster. After Lance Corporal Perez was loaded on the Black Hawk, it was a total of 11.2 minutes of flight time where every minute felt like an hour, said Du in a later interview. When dealing with this, not knowing that any movement could be your last, 18 inches from the patient's legs was about 360 gallons of aviation fuel. Should the warhead detonate in the close confines of the helicopter, there would be virtually no hope of survival, and the Black Hawk would go down in a fiery wreck. During the flight, medic Mark Edens and crew chief Robert Hardesty worked quickly to stabilize the wounded Marine, keeping him alive while also not jarring the embedded rocket, while Captain Dew was coordinating with personnel on the ground at nearby FOB Edinburgh including medical staff and explosive ordnance disposal units, as well as keeping in contact with the medevac's escorts who were informed to keep a safe distance from the volatile Black Hawk. 
there was a risk that should the grenade detonate, the aviation fuel would also combust, sending shrapnel into the escorts compounding the tragedy. Once they landed at the forward operating base, they were met at the landing zone by Navy Lieutenant Commander James Gennari, who was head of the surgical company at FOB Edinburgh, and Army EOD Staff Sergeant Ben Summerfield. The other staff at the FOB were kept at a safe distance to minimize casualties should the grenade detonate. Without giving a second thought to the danger, Gennari held Perez's hand and administered pain medication to the still-conscious Marine as Summerfield went to work. The EOD tech took a firm hold of the projectile and firmly pulled three times before it finally came free from his leg. Well, the truth of it is, I said a prayer and I thank God for everything I had, Gennari later told a news outlet of the incident. Whether or not the grenade was going to blow up, I left it to him, and I just worried about keeping the Lance Corporal's airway open. I think the reason that I did it, I didn't give it more than a thought or two, but I knew that I'm sent out there by the Marine Corps to save lives, and he was in danger, and I looked at it as my duty and job to go do that. In one of the most dramatic photos of the war in Afghanistan, a photographer, peering from behind the safety of a sandbag barricade, captured the image of Gennari holding Perez still as Summerfield pulled the rocket from his leg. Once the unexploded round was safely out of the way, Gennari and the rest of FOB Edinburgh's medical staff went to work on their patient. While Summerfield and Gennari were working on Perez, the rest of the medical staff was not idle. They were making the necessary preparations to treat the wounded Marine. Once the scene was made safe, they sprang into action, providing what aid they could to the shocked Perez. Perez's wounds were so severe that in Summerfield's estimation, he would have died had he not received prompt medical attention. Once in a stable condition, and the infamous RPG now far away from Perez, he was cleared for transport for intensive medical care at Bastion Hospital, a more extensive medical facility able to provide more sophisticated treatment. Once again, Captain Dew piloted his Black Hawk, as Edens and Hardesty tended to Perez. Though they no longer had to deal with the harrowing experience of their previous flight together, this trip was far from uneventful. An equipment malfunction caused Perez's ventilator to shut off, threatening to suffocate him. Edens and Hardesty both worked calmly and professionally, manually providing oxygen to Perez, bringing him back to a stable condition. Once at Bastion Hospital, Perez was now under the care of more sophisticated medical facilities and was able to start the long road to recovery. Although a mere 24 minutes elapsed from the time Perez was hit by the RPG to his arrival at FOB Edinburgh, there is no doubt that the fast response of Captain Dew and the specialists Mark Edens and Robert Hardesty made the difference between life and death for the young Marine. This speed was only made possible by their willingness to put their own lives in danger and to disregard proper procedure to do what they felt was right. The Kajaki Dam Incident Armed combat is among the most traumatic, frightening, and horrific experiences that a person would ever have to encounter. In spite of the deadly situations in which soldiers are placed, some remarkable individuals overcome the terrible conditions and perform feats of bravery in the service of their country and for their comrades. Regardless of these acts of heroism, they sometimes are hampered by poor decision-making and a lack of foresight by their leadership. On September 6, 2006, members of the UK's 3rd Battalion Parachute Regiment were stationed in the area of the Kajaki Dam, located in Afghanistan's Helmand province. The dam was built in the 1950s and was later outfitted with hydroelectric generators, providing electricity for the local region. The area was a known bastion for Taliban operations in the province. Operating out of a pair of lookout posts codenamed Athena and Normandy, the men posted there were tasked with monitoring Taliban movements in the volatile region. On that day, spotters at the Normandy post noticed a group of armed men setting up a checkpoint at a nearby village. The interpreter that was assigned to the group stated that the village loudspeaker, usually used for the ritual call to prayer, was being repurposed by the Taliban to incite the locals to attack the British outpost. Lance Corporal Stuart Hale, a designated sniper, suggested that he engage the insurgents at long range with his rifle, something that his immediate superior, Corporal Stu Pearson, agreed to. Joined by Fusilier Dean Farrell and Private Chris Harvey for protection, Hale maneuvered closer for a clear shot. 
As he made his way to a suitable location, Hale leapt over a dry creek bed. When his boots hit the ground, he heard an explosion. Looking down, he saw he was missing a finger and part of his right leg. The impact of his landing had triggered a Soviet-era anti-personnel landmine. I initially thought that I just slipped, he recalls, and then it dawned on me what had happened. Hearing the explosion, Corporal Mark Wright and eight other men, which included medics and stretcher bearers, made their way to Hale's location. A safe path was made and medical attention was given to him, including morphine and a tourniquet on his wounded leg. A medevac helicopter was called and the men waited for its arrival. It was at this point that a bad day suddenly got a lot worse. During the wait, Stu Pearson, trying to get comfortable, lost his footing and set off another mine. While the dust from this latest explosion was still settling, the horrible realization hit the men. They were standing in the middle of an uncleared minefield, left over from the Soviet occupation of the country in the 1980s, and one unlucky move could trigger more of the deadly devices. Unable to be reached by his comrades, Pearson applied a tourniquet to himself and injected morphine to ease the pain as they waited for the rescue chopper. The men had called for a helicopter equipped with a winch system. This way, the wounded soldier can be loaded onto the medevac while limiting the downdraft of the rotor blades, which could set off other mines, while also keeping the aircraft out of range of any subsequent blasts. Ideally, the helicopter would be in the form of a UH-60 Blackhawk, a multi-role aircraft that has a relatively light downdraft. Unfortunately, the only Blackhawks available in the area were in use by nearby American forces and were busy on other missions. Instead of the lightweight specialist helicopter, the medevac came in the form of a large British CH-47 Chinook. This twin-rotored aircraft fulfills multiple roles, but is most often used to haul heavy cargo and has the raw power to lift two Humvees. It can also be used for troop transport or medevac missions, able to hold 33 fully equipped soldiers or hold stretchers for 26 wounded. The Chinook came in for a landing. As it lacked the winch gear to haul the wounded men to safety, the men frantically tried to wave the giant helicopter away, lest the immense downdraft trigger more mines. Eventually, the pilot noticed the men's warning and flew away from the clustered groups, but it was too late. The wind produced by the powerful twin rotors shifted rocks and boulders, which set off another mine near Wright and the others tending to Stuart Hale. The resulting explosion sent pieces of shrapnel into Wright's chest, face, arms, and neck. Medic Alex Craig was hit by the blast, and Stu Pearson received further damage to his injured leg. Craig managed to clear the area, but Wright was too badly injured to move. The remaining medic, Paul Hartley, devised an ingenious plan to reach his wounded comrades. He would throw his medical bag to the ground. If the force of the impact didn't detonate a mine, he would leap to that spot, repeating the process over and over again, playing a deadly game of leapfrog to cover the 30 meters between him and his wounded companions. In spite of his life-threatening injuries, Wright continued to issue commands to his men, shouting encouragement to them and doing what he could to keep control of the rapidly deteriorating situation, even as he continued to bleed out. I just wanted to close my eyes, but Mark wouldn't let anyone fall asleep. He kept shouting at us, Pearson recalled. Although Mark was badly injured, he still kept us in touch with what was going on, with the information he was being given. He relayed to the men that the American Black Hawk helicopters had been made available and were on their way with proper winch equipment, but they were coming from distant Kandahar, over an hour away. Just as the terrible situation was stabilized, there was yet another explosion. Someone had tossed a water bottle to Fusilier Andrew Barlow, who lost his footing and detonated a fourth mine. The resulting blast blew off the lower portion of his left leg, and fragments struck Private David Prosser, as well as Wright, who was further injured by the shrapnel. Some time later, a pair of Blackhawks arrived and were able to lift the men without further incident. They were transferred onto waiting British Chinooks outside of the minefield, which took the men to a field hospital. Though still conscious, when he was loaded onto the helicopter, the numerous injuries were too much for Wright. In spite of the efforts of the medical crew, Mark Wright succumbed to his wounds while in transit. The entire incident from the first explosion to the arrival of the Blackhawks had lasted for four hours. In all, seven British soldiers had been hit by the Soviet-era mines. Mark Wright was killed, and three men would lose limbs. For his bravery and devotion to duty under extraordinary circumstances, Wright would be posthumously awarded the George Cross. 
For their actions, Lance Corporal Paul Hartley and Fusilier Andrew Barlow would both be awarded George Medals, and Stuart Patterson would be awarded the Queen's Medal. In the wake of this incident, an inquiry was called to investigate the failures that led to the tragedy. Coroner Andrew Walker condemned British military chiefs for sending troops into combat without the proper equipment. That a brave soldier is lost in battle is always a matter of deep sadness, but when that life is lost where it need not have been because of a lack of equipment and assets, those responsible should hang their heads in shame, Walker would say about the incident. A military inquest into the incident placed the blame on the high command for not giving its soldiers the proper equipment and being forced to rely on the Americans for minefield extractions. Had suitable equipment been available, Wright's injuries may not have been fatal, the inquest concluded. Five of the wounded men would sue the British Ministry of Defense for negligence, blaming the excessive casualties on the unavailability of winch-equipped helicopters, a necessity for extracting soldiers from minefields. Also mentioned in the lawsuit was the failure to provide maps of the area's minefields, though these were readily available, as well as communication breakdowns due to radio failures. The compensation would be settled out of court for an undisclosed seven-figure settlement. The lawyer representing Wright's family during the case stated, quote, There has clearly been a really serious systemic failure to provide suitable training, intelligence, and resources, end quote. In the wake of this incident, major changes were implemented, and all British helicopters operating in Afghanistan would be fitted with the proper winch equipment in order to prevent a repeat of the tragedy. The events of the Kajaki Dam incident were the basis of the 2014 movie Kajaki, which dramatized the events on that fateful day.